would like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable. First 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no censors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. Hot time, 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond. Isn't the Lambda site off-world, sir? Now this is the Prince Martha Coast, and in this particular region I found six or seven things, but none quite so clear as this. When you zoom in, very clearly, you can see the outlines of an aircraft. About two weeks ago, there was a viewer that had put up um, a picture and sent me an email with the picture saying, does this look like a jet to you? And of course, I looked at it and definitely was. And we found another one in the region and another thing that looked very much like one on the ground. This is a very different, much, much more detailed image. Here we can see very clearly the nose, the cockpit. We can see what looks like perhaps an air intake. We can see the wings. We can see what looks like perhaps vertical stabilizers on the rear. There's a couple of things on the top of the rear wings. What those are, I don't know, but I really don't know how you look at this image. Unlike yesterday when I had to do a lot of enhancement to show the bird, this takes no enhancement. You can see this thing from nearly a mile up. And it's it's clear from a mile up. This is a uh, this is actually it's it's kind of hard. It says eye altitude 8190 feet, but we're at elevation 8000 feet. So really we're only about 200 feet above the craft at this time. So, it's out there. The evidence is out there. If we applied the same standard for life on other planets to Antarctica, they would be giving daily news briefs. 
daily press conferences. The first standard that we apply for life on other planets, fresh water. Water ice, actually. It doesn't even have to be liquid. 70% of the fresh water on this planet exists at the South Pole. If this were some planet that we were trying to investigate for life, this would be the first place we would go to try to find it. They also look for habitability. They look for signs of heat. Because, of course, the heat and the ice makes water, water, liquid water, being where life begins. Volcanic activity all over the place. When you couple that with the imagery and the ancient nature of the continent, I don't know how anyone could ever make the allegation that there are no native Antarcticans or that they couldn't be living under that ice sheet. I mean, we have subterranean tunnels here and we aren't covered with miles of ice that people could live in and exist in for indefinite amount of times. We've cut them out of the um, caves in the limestone of Missouri. That there couldn't have been pockets of life that survived what happened down there, adapted to it. They could be so much more advanced than us that the issue with the ice was an annoyance given what the Navy has revealed, that there are craft that fly in our skies that can make an F-18 look like a horse and carriage, I think it bears looking into. And in the documentary that talks about this recent issue with the Navy declassifying these videos, what they saw when they arrived at the location where these uh, unidentified craft were, was a disturbance on the ocean surface first, before they saw the aircraft. So these things, whatever they are, are, to my mind, not coming from outer space. They're coming from under Antarctica. They're coming from our deep oceans. The Pacific Ocean alone has more area in it than the continents, the areas above the land. That's how big it is. And given the depth of it, given our complete inability to deal with it, when you see things like what's on your screen right now, how can you deny it? This might have been a craft from a time long ago when they actually flew the skies the way we do with aircraft. I don't know of any SR-71 Blackbirds that got lost in Antarctica, and that's exactly what this looks like. To be very truthful, it's very, very, very close. The two, these might be engines right here, or mounts for them, or intakes for them. It's hard to say. But the imagery is pretty undeniable. And in the region, you will also, almost every single time when you're looking, you'll find other things, many other things in the region that'll let you, that'll let you know that you're on the right path. Directly above, let's see if I can find this. There was something very close to this I wanted to show that revealed, oh, wait a minute, it's down here. This is actually what got me started in the region. It was another vessel, another boat. See the bow? Now this one, maybe, might be completely capsized. This might be some evidence of something on the keel right here, but once again, the shape is undeniable. It sticks out like a sore thumb. When you look at the whole region and you see what's just ice and snow, 
this thing has a perfect place carved out for itself right here. And what else was in the region? A lot of evidence of green. And this is kind of a hard thing to show, but under the ice right here, something very uh, greenish. It shows up yellow because it's coming through blue. But this is this was the part here I wanted to show. The depth of that green is foliage level. This is uh that's a, that's either the biggest emerald deposit on the face of the planet or that's foliage. And if you have foliage growing on the surface at 8000 feet above sea level, imagine what's going on under the ice sheet. And a three-mile-high ice sheet, which our own scientists say exists down there, you could have a civilization on the surface with an ice roof, an ice dome over them, a mile high. It could be 100 miles wide and 100 miles long. And they could have an endless supply, endless supply. Of fresh water. The only thing that they would be missing would be direct sunlight, but we also know that there's a great many plants that grow in the absence of sunlight. They could also be piping sunlight in, and we have that technology. It's very basic. You can get these things for your house where you have a skylight in one side and through a series of mirrors you can pump direct sunlight into rooms below the surface. That's not a hard thing to do. So all of the reasons that one might have to deny life down there, you know, they're becoming less and less and less. And I guess I'll just leave that there and let you guys um, discuss this for yourself. Thank you so much for the support. Like, share, subscribe. We'll see you next time. Back in 2017, when the current administration took power, one of the things that they announced very early on was going to be very high on their agenda was the development of the United States Space Force. This took a lot of people by surprise. They couldn't understand why it was important to develop a sixth branch of the United States military. Well, in today's video, I would like to put some of the puzzle pieces together and show some events and things that have gone on behind the scenes that have made this a number one priority. Now recently we have observed a couple of very strange white flashes occur over the southern United States. It was in shortwave infrared telemetry that was tracking Hurricane Delta. When we plotted these flashes on Google Earth, they began and ended over known Air Force or NASA facilities. The United States Space Force is still currently technically a department of the Air Force, working with NASA. So that makes me believe what we saw weren't just glitches in the radar. There has also been a big push from intelligence agencies to use the military to develop the information battle space because truly this is where wars are won and lost. Military intelligence, a lot of people like to poke fun and say that it's not necessary or that it's overblown, but really, when you can determine what your enemy is doing at any time of day, you have him. And consequently, if you can keep him from knowing what you're doing, he can never win. Because he never knows what he has to prepare for. Now, there are two specific things that have happened in the past that I would like to correlate and also tie it into Antarctica, believe it or not. There's something down there that I think makes perfect sense for what we've been seeing. 
One of the theories I had about these flashes was that it may have been the test of an aircraft, an advanced aircraft, that used a very strange technology that blasts the air in front of the craft, the leading edge of the craft, with ionizing radiation that displaces the atmosphere, that allows the craft to not only fly faster, but it makes it undetectable to radar. That's why this only showed up in the infrared. And let me show you those images real quick. This is the one from Tyndall to Nashville. And this is the one from Lake Charles up to Tulsa. This is why they appeared this way. You wouldn't have been able to see this with the naked eye. Now, the two events that I'm talking about, when you put them together, they make perfect sense. On the right is one of the early stages of the SR-71 Blackbird. It's called the YF-12. The YF-12 and all of the predecessors and the ones that came after were using three different techniques to affect their mission. It carried no offensive payload. The job of the SR-71, of course, was to fly higher and faster than anything that could shoot it down and do so undetected over enemy space to gather intelligence. That was its job. Now, there was a problem, though. Those two giant engines you see on the wing, those were almost impossible to hide from enemy radar. They developed a fuel that they could use that burned cesium, that created plasma in the exhaust that hid these craft from the rear. But that's not really the part that you need to hide. You need to hide the nose. So one of the big problems this craft always had in hiding or using any type of stealth technology was those two giant engines. Now, what if there were a technology that were developed that it wouldn't matter how high you flew, it wouldn't matter how fast you flew? The radar couldn't see you. The radar could not see you. And if a radar can't see you, a missile can't track you. It's just that simple. If they can't see you and they can't lock onto you or know where you are, they can't fire a missile, correct? So two of the technologies actually worked against the third. The flying high and the flying fast. What you needed to put on the aircraft to make that happen made it more visible to radar. Now, let's talk about the image on the left for a minute. Back in 2004, off the coast of Baja, and we talked about this in another video, over a six-day period, an entire carrier strike group observed these very strange, what they described as tic-tac crap, that had the ability to fly without wings, without engines, and could move in ways that justified physics, at least known physics. And they could do nothing about them. Now, they observed no offensive action at all from these craft. But it was clear they were light years ahead of what we had. Basically, what occurred in 2004 with the Nimitz is exactly what the CIA was going for with the SR-71 project. Meaning, if they could have affected a mission with a craft designed for observation, they could have had no greater success than what the Tic Tac craft did. Now, remember talking about those engines, those giant Pratt & Whitney monsters that propelled the thing so fast that it thought it could outrun any missile. Well, what do we know about missiles? Missiles don't have human beings on board meaning that they can fly faster and turn harder than any manned aircraft, just because of physical limitations. So the idea that no one would ever develop a missile that could fly that high or fly that fast was a little bit, you know, Pollyanna. 
the only technology that really mattered was the not being seen part. And that was the whole goal. Now, why did I bring all of that up? What do these two things have to do with each other? Given that one is an attempt at a mission and the other is the success of that mission, what better place to test something like that than Antarctica? Many, many months ago, when we were looking into Antarctica, we found a location where on the surface we saw what appeared to be something like the YF-12 or the SR-71 setting there on the ice. Now, one of the things that a lot of the detractors to this video said is that where are the engines? Where are the engines? If it's one of these craft, where are the engines? Well, if they developed the ability to use these electron guns to hide from the radar to the point that speed was no longer an issue, you wouldn't put those giant engines on there, would you? I'll give you the location here in Antarctica so that you can go find this for yourself and look at it. See, I believe this to be a lost aircraft. One that crashed. An experimental stage of one. And the reason I believe that is this. Let me bring up the full image here and turn the light down. I turned it up so that you guys could see a little bit closer the detail. The reason I believe this to be one of those aircraft is twofold. When you use Google Earth Pro, you have a time slider up here, or you can choose to have one. Now this is the image from 11-26-2011. This was seven years after the issue with the Nimitz. They saw something with those craft that they wanted to create for themselves. How can we do this? And they looked at the SR-71 and they said, well, see, it's been retired for a long time. And one of the main reasons is it can no longer outfly missiles. It can no longer get beyond the range of radars just with height, especially with satellite technology. What they really need is a plane that can disappear. And they observed that, and that's actually in the report, with this Tic Tac craft. So the only platform they had to test with was this. The first thing they would have to do is get rid of those engines. Because if they develop the radar shielding technology, the engines won't be necessary. You'll need some method of propulsion, of course, absolutely, but not those two giant monsters that give it away. This looks like a developmental stage of that. Now, I talked about the date for a reason. This very remote part of Antarctica, you would have to ask yourself a question, why? Why would they be taking high detailed, high res detailed photos of this region? And more importantly, why would they take two images within two days? See, this is an image from 1124, 2011. Not all of Antarctica is imaged high res. Very few regions are, in fact. And the ones that are, you might get an image every three months. Most of them are every year. In this particular place, in this particular location, they took two high-res images of this tiny region in two days. 11-24, This is 11 I believe at this time they lost an aircraft. And they had to use satellite imagery to find where it went down because it was moving so fast and they lost radar telemetry on it. And this is what they're developing. This electron gun laser um, technique 
of superheating the atmosphere off the leading edge of an aircraft to literally pull it out of the atmosphere and allow it to achieve incredible speeds, number one, but number two, hide it from radars. It has both of those benefits, this technology. And that's what I truly believe we're seeing. This craft, I know it looks very strange, doesn't it looks kind of like an SR-71, but not totally. This is what I think we're seeing. An SR-71 with much smaller engines that don't uh, protrude off the leading wing, leading edge of the wing. And that maybe this large fuselage right here might be where they house this laser technology. And here's the final piece of information about this that makes this a virtual slam dunk for me. When you go to tools, you can bring up a ruler and you can measure things on the surface. We're going to measure this in feet. And we did this before in another video. It's roughly 88 feet long in that range. And that's exactly the length of an SR-71 within a couple of feet. The wingspan is the exact same. The breakdown on this is virtually exactly what you would expect to see. This is the technology they're using. And some have asked about the fires, maybe. You know, maybe one mis malfunctions and, you know, when you have the derechos out in California and all that dry tinder and all that wind, it only takes a small spark. You don't need some huge high-powered laser to set off a fire. People have been doing it with the gender reveals and those tiny, tiny little explosives setting off massive wildfires. So this is the idea. What happened in 2004 off Point Magoo, by the way, where they're developing now high energy laser systems, Navy base, is tied directly to the SR-71 project. And this is what the Space Force is really all about. What it does is it gives the military the ability to work with alphabet agencies and work with information in a way they haven't before. Because that's what warfare is really all about. It's about information. If you don't know what your enemy has and he doesn't know what you have, it's even battlefield. But if one knows and the other doesn't, it's over. And now with satellite technology and the ability to look down and in real time get information about anything anywhere from the world around the world, forget flying fast, forget flying high. If you can just be invisible or know where everybody who is looking for you is located, you can avoid that. That was one of the hardest things. Nobody really knew where and to what extent at the time of the SR-71, when it was being developed, where those radar stations were in Russia. Now, of course, with satellite tech, we know. So the idea of flying faster and flying higher, eh, it's great to a certain extent, but I'm sure the vast majority of those aircraft that are doing these tests are unmanned. But why would you need a manned aircraft? When it's all really about information. All the information gleaned from the aircraft gets beamed up to a satellite and then back down to somebody sitting in a safe, warm, cozy office somewhere. No reason to put anybody 
in harm's way. So anyway, that's what this was about, this uh, video today. The Space Force, NASA, what they're really doing, working with alphabet agencies, intelligence. This is really all intelligence work. Now, can these possibly be developed in the future to deliver payloads to certain places? Well, sure. But right now, the most important quote-unquote payload that needs to be delivered is the intelligence back to command. And I wonder why now, looking back, they named the SR-71 project Oxcart. Now I understand. Because it was. It was about delivering a payload back to intelligence headquarters. So, I will leave it there. God bless. Thank you so much for the support. I will give you the links to all the articles. There's a ton of them. All sorts of information about this, especially from uh, The Drive. Really great article, Blasting the Air in Front of Hypersonic Vehicles with Lasers Could Unlock Unprecedented Speeds. It also hides them from radars. And that's the part that uh, isn't really covered as much as it should be. It has a twofold effect. And this is what I think really ties in the issue with the Nimitz and the SR-71 and this image from Am that we found in Antarctica. Because to my mind, there's really no question. There's truthfully no question that that is an aircraft, and it was lost down there. And I'll give you, of course, the location, Google Earth Pro. Just download it to your laptop or your computer and put in the coordinates, and it'll take you there. And you can look at it for yourself. Pretty clear that that's an aircraft. It's got all of the uh, necessary things that you would expect. Triangular shape, fuselage, what looks like a cockpit, two engines, and the shape is, and the size is virtually identical to an SR-71 or some prototype of it. But the Space Force. Oh, this is a, I wish I would have brought this up. This is the report from... Uh, that engagement in 2004 of the Nimitz. I'll give you that link too so that you can make your own decision on this. But we will see you next time. Like, share, subscribe. Would like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable. First 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no censors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have... Vimeo that we're partnering with and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you and thank you so much. Hot dial, 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before?
Thank you.